Let's see. Hey, oh, hi, hello, I'm Hippie Rat, and it makes me very, very happy to say this. Happy fifth birthday, Freddy Fazbear. That's right. Five years ago, a small indie game by the name of Five Nights at Freddy's was released, and the cultural impact it had had caused these past five years to truly become the five years of Freddy. You see... And this may come as a bit of a shock to you, since the general consensus around the more critical-minded on YouTube is that they're above the cringy mess that is the Five Nights at Freddy's series, with special care to distance themselves from the Five Nights at Freddy's fan base. But generally speaking, I like Five Nights at Freddy's. Fuck it, I'm allowed to like what I want. I don't have to say, oh, Five Nights at Freddy's has jump scares in it, therefore it's bad. In fact, I will punch you in the face by saying the exact opposite. But first, let me bring you back to the beginning. On May 17th, 1977, the first Chuck E. Cheese's, then operating under the name Chuck E. Cheese's Pizza Time Theater, opened its doors. A bunch of other stuff happened that isn't as interesting. I just wanted to mention the very beginning because it's poetic and stuff. Until 30 years later, in the mid-double O's, where yours truly visited a local Chuck E. Cheese franchise semi-regularly while growing up. Now, it's not like I was there every damn day or anything. No, that would be silly. Imagine my current upload schedule. Okay, now, just about a quarter as frequent as that, and yeah, that's just about how often I'd visit. Regardless, even as someone who would go once in a blue moon, I and all my friends knew the legends. The spooky, soapian tales of children never wanting the fun to end. So they remain inside the restaurant arcade once it closes to spend all night playing games, only to find that the robotic Charles Entertainment Cheese and his friends hunt down and kill any kid still present in the after hours. These were real urban legends that persisted among many children which is a difficult thing to imagine now in a world where the leading force in Chuck E. Cheese-inspired horror is, as we all know, Five Nights at Freddy's. The persistence of these urban legends among kids led me to a thought I first perceived in mid-August 2014. How had no one done this yet? Yes, when Five Nights at Freddy's debuted on August 8, 2014, it was met with astoundingly positive reception and cheers of, well, yeah, duh, of course. Being the first to dip his toes into the utilization of a predominant urban legend, as well as introducing easy to learn yet still challenging gameplay mechanics for people of all ages to enjoy, as well as a surplus of lore and easter eggs to uncover, Scott Cawthon's game exploded in popularity. Soon enough, it was sequel time. Seeing as how the first game built two large, mysterious events into its timeline without divulging enough details about either of them, the sequel would need to elaborate somewhat. Here's where we start seeing some missteps. You see, when the first game was being explored by lore seekers, the two mysterious events included the murder of five children on the establishment, with the subsequent implication of their bodies being hidden in the suits used to place over the animatronic characters. The other one was the bite of 87. Right away, it becomes clear that what needed answering wasn't the murder of the children. No, we understood that enough. The most deliberation had over the game was the question of who was the culprit of the mysterious Bite of 87? Could it have been Foxy, and that's why he's out of order? Could it have been Freddy Fazbear, since his suit shows signs of struggle against someone? Golden Freddy, the most enigmatic character in the game? Bonnie? Chica? 
everyone's a suspect. Now, I'm not going to act like Scott didn't give anyone any information at all regarding the Bite of 87 in the sequel. The game puts a date to the event and some details around it, including the fact that it connects directly with the ghosts of the children murdered by the guy who, by the way, dominates the lore. Seriously, he is all over the lore now, and all that was learned was that he wore a gold-colored suit while committing the crimes, which amounted to nothing but a bait-and-switch come the third game. Now, I'm gonna start talking about why the first game was scary, and the second game isn't. This can get somewhat subjective, because that's how fear works, but the grimy, gritty look from the first Five Nights at Freddy's game, as well as the jump scares having a basis more in movement rather than just jumping out at the players, creates a much scarier atmosphere and thus disturbs you on a much deeper level. The tension, the payoff, even seeing the eyeballs popping out of the suit in the game over screen is more morbidly satisfying than what amounts to an image you've been seeing for the entirety of the game thus far. The textures from the first game looked more interesting, the sense of mystery was handled much more subtly, and... I, you know what? Yeah, that first game was a lot more subtle. Everything about the second game feels like Coffin was trying a bit too hard to up the ante from the first. The first game had an enemy that was defined by his more decrepit look. The second game has six of those. The first game had five enemies. The second game has 11. The first game had like five or six different types of hallucinations. The second game has just a, just a fat ton. Your sense of safety in the first game was defined by your doors. Second game has no doors. The first game gave creepy mystery exposition by means of subtle changes to in-game elements. The second game has playable cutscenes spoon-feeding the lore to the player. Truly, the first game became a phenomenon through its subtlety, something that isn't given enough credit because this is a game series criticized so heavily for indulging on jump scares. But the second game heavily changed that direction of subtlety to something a little bit more appetizing to a wider audience. Kinda like Saw. And I like the Saw franchise. So why don't I like Five Nights at Freddy's 2? Five Nights at Freddy's felt like Chuck E. Cheese. The building looks so much more real, and the animatronics resemble the look and textures of what they're based on so much more. The only real additions in the sequel I can qualify are a carousel and a prize counter, which are very appreciated inclusions that do help add to the atmosphere, but they only go so far when the entire building and the characters within it look more fake and plastic than a breast implant. But what about the rest of the franchise? For years, I have been operating under the insistence that Five Nights at Freddy's should be looked at under the lens of being a trilogy. For three games, the story, while being loose and up for interpretation, still was contained enough for any general human to be able to glance at it and understand what happened, even with major details having been excluded. And it was around the fourth game that the series went off the rails, but I'll get to that later. Sometime after gaming personality Lewis Dawkins completed the infamous 50-20 challenge in the 8th game of the series, 
Ultimate Custom Night, he was treated to an exclusive interview with Scott Cawthon, which was a surprising and exciting event since his typical reclusiveness added to the mystery of the series. In that interview, Scott not only confirmed that he intended for the series to be a trilogy, was this meant to be the final game? When I was making that game, mm -hmm. in my mind, that was the end of a trilogy. But explained why it wasn't. Do you want to know what convinced him to make a fourth game? You wouldn't believe me even if I told you. I'm still going to tell you. Here is a clip exemplifying why Five Nights at Freddy's 4 exists. <laughs> Confused? Give me a second to explain. The third game was criticized not only for being somewhat easier than the previous two games. I don't know if it was just pure skill that got me through that last level so quickly, or if the fact that it wasn't luck based like the last ones, which meant that you had to be perfect at the perfect time to be able to beat it. But because the jump scares from the main enemy of the game, Springtrap, weren't as intense as the jump scares in the previous games. I will repeat that. The game was criticized for not having jump scares that were as intense, and this was enough to justify the creation of another game in the series, made almost exclusively to be more intense than the previous game. Remember when Five Nights at Freddy's 4 came out and PewDiePie made a video criticizing it just for being a jump scare fest? I mean, I don't... The thing is, like, everyone wants me to play this game to get scared, but... After four games, it's... I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> you know there's just gonna be jump scares. If there's something else in that, then maybe I'll be scared, but it's like... If you know what to expect, then four times, then it's kind of like over. In 2015, that was considered to be a controversial moment in PewDiePie's career. And now here's a sentence I won't have many more chances to say. PewDiePie was right. You see, the first few games had a setting that was grounded somewhat in the reality established by the universe up to that point. Twice over, we saw it take place in an arcade restaurant, and in the third game, it was the same building that used to be an arcade restaurant, except it was renovated into a walk-through horror attraction named Fazbear's Fright decades after the restaurant fell into bankruptcy as a result of various tragedies associated with the location. Now, there's some minor plot holes you can grasp out of how they thought it would be a good marketing gimmick to turn what could have been a part of a strip mall into a horror attraction. I mean, the Chuck E. Cheese's I used to visit is stuck between an edible arrangement shop and a Mediterranean restaurant. I could barely imagine a seasonal Halloween shop in its place, let alone a full-on horror show. But the storyline and some supplementary materials imply that this building is somewhat isolated as a result of taking place in the small town of Hurricane, Utah, and I guess it's not too far-fetched to imagine a small building being dedicated to a horror attraction. Anyway, it's reasonably feasible for a horror game about the urban legend of the animatronic characters from Chuck E. Cheese's coming to life at night to take place in a Chuck E. Cheese. But you start losing me when you place us in a child's bedroom and introduce these monstrosities. Holy shit, these things are fucking dumb. They got, like, teeth and claws and shit all over the place. Half of them got mouths on their stomachs. These ones look like they're on fire. This is ridiculous. Like, is it fair to say we've officially jumped shark on what makes these animatronics scary? I mean, we kind of did that back with Mangle. Mangle is fucking stupid. That second head? What was that even for? That's just there because it's scary and it doesn't fit enough in the universe to justify it. Here's Mangle now. I'm serious here. Am I allowed to say that this isn't scary? This was designed to be so scary that it is no longer scary. Here's a word that y'all should start utilizing in your day-to-day -day lives. That word of the day is subtlety. 
I revisited Chuck E. Cheese's a few years ago for my little sister's birthday party, and with that chance I went to go look at the animatronic gang, and it was a horrific sight. Half of them had milked over eyes, there was rust rubbed into the fur of the Helen Henny suit, Pasquale's neck was frayed into a horrible mess of plush, and the main man himself had broken. Left in a stilted pose, occasionally twitching eerily, with his microphone taped onto his hand. The parallels I could draw to how they portrayed the characters as decrepit in the first game. If the costumes are stained with age, they're frayed and torn, it felt legitimately like a franchise had these characters, but lacked the money to continually repair them. Or wash them. They twitch, their servos lock up, etc, etc. The second game takes this way too much to the extreme, and it suffers because of it. Bonnie is missing his entire face. Chica lost her arms. Mangle is f***ed. Where is the subtlety? It was much scarier when it felt more like these characters were plausible to be seen. So, what about Springtrap? Springtrap is my fucking favorite. I'm not even joking. You guys are probably all up in arms immediately because he's a zombie man stuck inside of an animatronic. A and yeah, I do think uh, the lore is a little bit hokey here, somewhat convoluted, but Five Nights at Freddy's 3 is a testament to subtlety. Hear me out. Springtrap presents itself as a much more conscious, thinking, plotting figure, similar to Freddy Fazbear in the first game. The character design itself holds the corpse of the man who murdered those children years before, and you get to see the story of how he ended up in this animatronic unfold in a very clever way. The old training tapes are used to explain how the combination animatronic and mascot suit works, its weaknesses, and its fatal shortcomings that led to the building renovations that kept it imprisoned up until now, and the playable cutscenes show why he met the fate he did. The style of the video game does not allow for a lot of traditional step-by-step -step storytelling, so Scott Cawthon worked around it and created a very chilling experience. I love how you can only see the corpse of the child murderer in certain angles, including the version of the jump scare that you would naturally see less often. Being able to just barely see a rotting corpse past the suit in a series that so far has limited its gore to implications and pixel art is such a cool change of pace. And once again, I'd like to point out the methodical nature of the character and connect back to the jump scares. The spring trap jump scares in Five Nights at Freddy's 3 are the best jump scares in the series, even though they were not as loud and fast as the rest of the series. It's so much more horrifying to see this thing slowly approach you like it does. I say this thing because... It goes so much further than being an animatronic like all the characters in the previous games. The decay and grotesqueness are pronounced enough to deem beautifully uncanny, but subtle enough to not be dumb looking. It walks and moves like a man, but the way it reaches you is like an animal, prowling, stalking its prey. Yes, it's a jump scare, but it's a damn good one. No, it's not quite as loud and jarring, but that's what makes good horror. I guess what I'm saying is, sometimes what makes a character work in horror doesn't exist at all in another. And that's fine, so long as a decent balance can be met before we leave the plane of scary, and many things can help that balance. If the lore connects back in an interesting enough way, if the setting complements the characters, all that kind of stuff. See, in Five Nights at Freddy's 4, the setting doesn't really work. Probably any other boogeymen would work here, but not these robot ones. I know Scott Cawthon had actual nightmares reflecting the events of this game, which was likely an inspiration for this game, 
But to make such a large leap in whatever pseudo-realism this series held up to this point, you cut my suspension of disbelief, and the bridge falls. So does the lore help? Kinda? But not quite in a satisfying enough way. And especially not with how much the nature of the lore leaves the major factors of gameplay up to interpretation. This is kind of a huge flaw that makes taking in the story very difficult. The largest consensus is that you play as the character known to fans as Crying Child, and the bulk of the game takes place in the dream state of the child, where a jump scare does not mean death, it instead means waking up scared in the middle of the night, and he must fall back asleep and not be awoken again in order to complete the night, and these nightmares are the result of his older brother and his friends constantly bullying and frightening him with Fazbear Entertainment character masks. This reaches a dramatic climax when we learn that the final nights are his nightmares while in a comatose dying state after having his head crushed in the jaws of the Fredbear animatronic after a prank goes wrong. Now this interpretation is the least ridiculous and calls for the least amount of a suspension of disbelief because the shit that I was upset by, how ridiculous it is that we play as a child in a bedroom tormented by the most demented version of the antagonist to date, is explained relatively easy by the events taking place in a dream while the Atari style plot development represents the waking life of the player character. Another interpretation is that these animatronics are real and actually tormenting the player character of Crying Child in the middle of the night in order to convince him to stay shuttered in his room so that he doesn't get killed by the killer animatronics and killer people associated with the pizzeria. This is a stupid interpretation, mainly because it actually involves this to be canonically f***ing real and walking and tangible and this f***ing ugly, as well as existing within a residence rather than its natural environment of anywhere else. If this is what was intended, then f*** this game. One more interpretation says that you play as a robot child that in other games grows up to be a robot man whose artificial flesh ends up rotting. But we'll get there. I don't even know what to say at this point because if Scott Cawthon intended to tell his story in this way, and MatPat gives a somewhat compelling argument in favor of this theory, then this series is far gone in terms of being even somewhat grounded in existing legend, and especially far gone in terms of following the story with the existence of definitive truth. And that's not to completely trash the game or anything, it was extremely exciting when this game first came out to see unfold the events of the ever enigmatic bite of 87. It was the mystery I wanted spelled out to me the most, and to see it unfold was too good to be true. Turns out it really, truly, literally was too good to be true, because this isn't the bite of 87, it's the bite of 83, mother- Scott Cawthon had the gall to say that this was the final chapter in the teasers. Hint at this game answering who the culprit of the bite of 87 is, and instead of treating the opportunity like a chance to wrap up all loose ends, he instead introduced a completely new event filled with its own missing details, only to entice the player with a box implied to hold the answer to how those missing details mesh together in a logical way, and when people failed to come anywhere close, he decided against ever showing the contents of said box, and instead leaving the series off on an ultimate cryptic cliffhanger, a problem caused mainly by his own faults in storytelling, and at that point, there's nothing left to do but take the game advertised as the final chapter, throw your hands up and say, f*** it, we're not even halfway done. And so, at least twice in a row, Scott Cawthon thought he would be happily complete with contributing new games for this series. He released a novel, which I'll brush on later, but eventually decided to add more to the FNAF universe, continue the story that he decided couldn't end 
on a locked box. I mean, he could have opened the box, but the fans wouldn't like it that way. So he went on to work on a new game, advertised in such subtle ways before releasing a trailer, and even still sending fans of the series scrambling over all the new concepts and ideas. A spin-off title, finally breaking the trend of numbering each game, but oh, so many of us know it as Five Nights at Freddy's 5. A shockingly scary piece. One that completely changed the tone of the series, from its macabre drama to its tongue-in-cheek humorism. The show will begin momentarily. Everyone, please stay in your seats. It's motherfucking FNAF World! What the- Yes, the commonly overlooked fifth title in the Five Nights lexicon, FNAF World, the cutesy RPG where you lead every character introduced in the first four games in the series on a quest to restore peace in the digital safe haven they all reside in, ultimately culminating in a battle against developer Scott Cawthon himself. It didn't do so well critically. Generally speaking, it seemed fairly well received, but a vocal minority spoke out over the apparent rushed feel of production, which kinda made sense. Scott had made it a habit to complete his games ahead of schedule and just allowing it to be released as soon as it's ready, and FNAF World was no exception. Now personally, I feel a little wary really critiquing this game myself because I've just never really been huge on RPGs in general and their grindy, life-dedicating nature, but of the RPGs I've experienced, FNAF World was a particularly fun one, with all its lore and different endings, and especially with Scott's self-critical meta-humor making its way into the game. One of the endings required you to defeat a boss structured after Chipper, a woodchuck character from one of Cawthon's previous games, Chipper and Son's Lumber Company, which was poorly received as a result of the character animations, inspiring the creation of the original Five Nights at Freddy's game. Robots! They're the f oh, they're robot beavers! That's not good. One minigame featured a Metroid-style shooter that has Freddy Fazbear destroying Scott Cawthon's head floating in a tank of water, shouting mad ramblings over how he will milk the series dry with as many bizarre spin-offs as he can. You can play as a set of paper plates from one of the party rooms in Five Nights at Freddy's 2. This game is f***ing insane. This game doesn't connect largely to the canon series, but does serve as a commentary and satire on the success of it, and the internet's connection to it. As much as Cawthon tries to bury this game and ignore it, I enjoyed it, and I think it added a very interesting dynamic to a series that had made a bit of a confusing turn. Here's the funny thing, though. Because of the outspoken few who felt that FNAF World wasn't a good way to end the series, Scott felt compelled once again to continue the series. It's a vicious cycle, you know. But then, most things in life are. The pendulum swings one way, then it swings the other. Now we return to darkness. It wasn't supposed to be like this. Now it's all a mess. He didn't know what else to do. He doesn't want to disappoint people. But his mind isn't right. He's made something terrible. Her name is Baby. It's too late to deactivate her. The show will begin momentarily. Everyone, please stay in your seats. Never before has a big bad in the series been given such a foreboding teaser. No puppet, no spring trap, no nightmare. Baby was a threatening force, out for blood. She was cold, methodical, and sentient. She was going to make Sister Location one of the most chilling experiences ever put into the series. Did you see her in that trailer? Holy crap, is she creepy. I wonder how her character will operate. I guess we have to wait until it releases on October 7th, 2016. The day finally reaches. It's time to see her in action. Ladies and gentlemen, here she is! What the f 
Five Nights at Freddy's sister location follows a main character named Eggs Benedict as he takes a job in an underground storage facility that holds a series of fun time animatronics. A group of robots designed with malicious intent by the child murderer of the previous games, revealed to be a business partner that owns a significant portion of Fazbear Entertainment, William Afton. This game is notably different from the other entries in the FNAF series, in that instead of tending to one group of tasks for a period of time, and then having the next level be the same tasks with an increased difficulty, Sister Location orders new tasks from the player in every level. While this makes for the most unique gaming experience out of the entire series, it also makes for some relatively weak game design. It's pretty frustrating the amount of times we learn how to play the game, only for that to never again be the game. The only exception to that is the Sister Location Custom Night DLC, released two months after the original release of the game, and it still does not affect the gameplay of the main story, so grain of salt. On your first night, you learn the importance of using lighting fixtures to see when the animatronics are on their stage, and the controlled shock mechanism that resets their system into making them return to their stage if they aren't already there. You immediately find out that it doesn't really matter because the light for Circus Baby Gallery is broken disallowing you from seeing Baby in her full glory in-game. It continues to become an even less relevant part of gameplay. On the second night, you hide from Biddy Babs underneath a desk. You are never again in a situation of peril after tugging on the metal sheet protecting you twice, and you only ever return to this desk for optional lore. This is the last time you will ever encounter the Biddy Babs while they are active. You then crawl through Ballora Gallery, stopping in your tracks every time you hear her music get too loud. You crawl through Ballora Gallery one more time later in the night, except the threat of jump scaring in Game Over is eliminated, and you never do that again. This is the last time you ever encounter Ballora while she is active. After that, you must reset the breakers while Funtime Freddy actively approaches you, only losing interest when you activate audio prompts resetting his progress. There is no gameplay mechanic that works in this way in any other portion of the game. This is the last time you ever encounter Funtime Freddy while he is still active. But not the last time you encounter his hand puppet, which is named Bon Bon after Quentin reviews his cat. Oh, Bonbon. Oh, goodness. Bonbon, no. no. That's that's Bee Monkey. Leave Bee Monkey alone, Bonbon. You're gonna break the cup, for God's sakes. Oh, Jesus, right? On night three, you have to walk through Funtime Auditorium, flashing a beacon of light at the right intervals to keep Funtime Foxy at a distance from you. You only ever perform this gameplay mechanic once more on the way back, and you are scripted in the game to fail it no matter what. This is the last time you ever encounter Funtime Foxy while he is still active. This is the game, and you know what? I'll be that guy. All of this makes for one of the worst games in the series. It's better than FNAF 2, and FNAF 4, and FNAF World, but it's such a flawed game that thrives so much in the fan community on novelty. It's the Five Nights at Freddy's game that isn't a Five Nights at Freddy's game. This, this game is kind of a mess. Like I said already, the style of introducing new mechanics only to never use them again is frustrating. It's also disappointing to only ever encounter each animatronic in one specific feature of gameplay, especially since you barely ever get any interaction at all with the two big bads of the game, Circus Baby and Ennard. Baby serves as a narrator of sorts for the game, but we learn that she's somewhat unreliable as a narrator at the end when she becomes one with Ennard. It was beyond disappointing to have Baby hyped up as the biggest threat we'd ever encounter, only to literally never see her in-game except for her 
deactivated form, just lying there like a fucking deactivated animatronic. Ennard is also very confusing in and of himself. The concept of Ennard is easy enough to get. It's an amalgamation of fun times Freddy and Foxy, Ballora, and Baby, but his actions in-game are really confusing. It's hard to tell if Ennard represents Baby the entire time, and the concept of Ennard isn't introduced to the game until the final night, and it just feels like a completely unwarranted climax. Like, it just happens. By the way, Ennard exists! And he escapes the storage facility by using your body as a meat suit. Good night! The only hint towards Ennard existing is that at the beginning of the same night that he's introduced, the mask he wears has been moved. I mean, I like that. I think it's clever to subtly move the mask elsewhere to imply that the entity that wears it is active and ready to torment. But the way that it fully ends up playing into the story is pretty clunky. It's just weird that Baby was such a huge thing in the promotional materials, yet literally all we get out of her in-game is the fact that her programming is responsible for the death of William Afton's daughter, who now haunts the animatronic. But her individualism is left so unutilized because she just ends up part of Ennard. How do we know that all of her motivations and all of the stories that we learned from her earlier weren't being spoon-fed to us from Ennard and not Baby. And that's not even talking about how Ennard chooses to work in-game. It instructs you to extract the good parts of Baby before sending her to the scooping room. I have no clue how Ennard would have a chance to go into the scooping room and meld with Baby's endoskeleton before you make it to the scooping room so that kind of just happens. It's never explained what happens to the good parts of Baby after the fact. I guess it's just eliminated, leaving Baby haunted by only the part of her soul that was corrupted by her father, the child murderer. But I don't know. I haven't even gotten to the private room ending, where you ignore the directions to the scooping room, yet instead of killing you, Ennard just f***s off, enters the private room before you, goes past that room into the other rooms off from the private room, and then turns back around and tries to kill you. But why though? This is described as the non-canon ending of the game, and yeah, I can imagine why, when it can only be accomplished by having your evil amalgamation of robots designed exclusively to kill, decide not to kill and just go for a f***ing walk to some other part of the building. This fake ending really only serves to provide the player with a chance to have a Five Nights at Freddy's experience in this Five Nights at Freddy's game, but then it loses that charm when it becomes a much more full Five Nights at Freddy's experience in the Custom Night DLC. And I still got problems! Check out our roster for the Sister Location Custom Night. Feel disappointed? I do! So not only were we deprived a full experience with Circus Baby in the main game, as well as lacking much of any experience with Ennard, both are absent in Custom Night. But don't worry, we have two different variations of both Biddy Babs and Mini Renas. Why the heck do we need that? Was it really not possible to trade some of their mechanics with Baby and Ennard? Couldn't Baby have done what Electrobab did? Couldn't Ennard have done what Mini Reno 1 did? You didn't even give Mini Reno's 1 and 2 unique names to differentiate each other! There's a reason that Sister Location Custom Night is the most forgotten part of this entire series, even over FNAF World! Let's talk about the lore. Here's the thing you should know. Eggs Benedict is actually Michael Afton, the son of William Afton, and thus brother of Baby. He's also either the older brother of Crying Child or 
He is crying child if you subscribe to the idea of crying child being a robot. I will hate your guts if you do. Here's what happens at the end of the game. You get your inside scooped, allowing Hennard to use your body to blend in as a human. Unfortunately, Michael Afton's flesh rots, and Ennard escapes, leaving him a purple husk of flesh, kept alive by the soul juice called Remnant that is injected into you during the scooping process as detailed in the following game. The way that this is shown to the player is deceitful. That is a simple fact. The reveal of Michael Afton's fate is deceitful because he is turned into the same purple sprite that represented William Afton, the child murderer, as he works in the shadows, and he has a monologue about coming to hunt his father over footage of Springtrap, while having the exact same sinister voice as was given to William Afton's voice lines. She can dance. She can sing. She's equipped with a built-in helium tank for inflating balloons right at her fingertips. She can take song requests. She can even dispense ice cream. They didn't recognize me at first, but then they thought I was you. This reveal implied so heavily that Michael Afton was actually the child murderer that ended up inside Springtrap, and it royally f***s up the timeline. Tons of people fell for it too, and that was no accident. It would have been easy to have Michael Afton's final rotten sprite be green instead of purple. It would have been easy to give Michael Afton a less sinister voice. It would have been easy to make it abundantly clear when this game takes place so as to eliminate timeline confusion. But no, just as he had teased so heavily that Five Nights at Freddy's 4 would reveal the bite of 87 only to add a completely separate bite without assuming people would get confused, Coffin teased the identity of Purple Guy only to add a completely separate Purple Guy without assuming people would get confused. Coffin made a point that every game would partially exist to clarify a confusing plot detail from the previous. In Sister Location, you can view the bedroom from FNAF 4 by typing in the code 1983 in the private room, confirming the event as a bite of 1983. In Pizzeria Simulator, Springtrap is directly credited as William Afton to convict him as the child murderer. The thing is, Coffin would not have to do this if he hadn't created a scenario that would confuse people in the first place. So many simple fixes that weren't utilized, convincing me that Coffin deliberately introduced those aspects of the lore specifically to confuse and distract. And for all that, Sister Location loses so many brownie points, and I look back on this as a specific low point in the series. For nearly a year, most updates to the series are books. In 2017, a sequel to the original novel was released, as well as a guidebook for the games and an activity book. Each of them held some level of lore reveals. The guidebook's main reveal is a piece of art teasing Scrap Baby, and the activity book was full of small lore bits that mostly relate back to Five Nights at Freddy's 4. Now, I like to treat these kinds of things pretty lightly because, you know, they're just cute little easter eggs included to add some more atmosphere to the book. But it gets pretty annoying to see some of the most ridiculous interpretations of the series being built so heavily on these books like Michael Afton actually being the character that is Crying Child, rebuilt as a robot man that, yes, got gutted and filled with another robot, all while still being the same robot, except Rotten. Now, for all I know, these interpretations and the way that they're made are correct. I don't know, it's not like Cawthon's gonna spill the beans on that front. But in the case that it is, then frankly, I just think it's too much to just sit with. I mean, 
hi, I'm that guy, but just because it may be the true form of the story does not mean that it's good in my eyes. Stories going from a simple urban legend premise to a bizarrely complicated, vague sci-fi chaos just aren't what I'm subscribing for, as much as it may fit into the genre of horror franchises that go on for a bit too long. With that, I think it's time we tackle the novels. The trilogy of The Silver Eyes, The Twisted Wand, and The Fourth Closet was written by Scott Coffin and Kira Breed Risley. The novels chronologically follow Charlie, a young woman returning to Hurricane Utah while learning the secrets of her past and her connections to the missing children incident concurrent with the events of the games. Now, you'd think that because this series exists, then we would be facing every question about the Five Nights at Freddy's storyline being answered. But no! Scott Cawthon has infamously described the status of the book's canon with the games as both being canon in their own separate universes. So essentially, yes, the novels are canon, as in many details about Five Nights at Freddy's would be revealed through these novels, but at the same time, many aspects of the novels are not canon and don't follow the games at all, blurring the lines. Remember that ridiculous theory about Michael Lafton being a robot? That theory exists because the fourth closet reveals that Charlie is a robot. These novels actually do what I was just criticizing the implicated story of the games to do, but to a substantial, quantifiable level, immortalized in print. Does that mean the books are bad? Honestly, not really. Being a fully realized story written out in novels in full detail rather than having the lore hidden in easter eggs helps build the more fictional aspects into a concept that I can follow easier. I feel like I'm not being clear enough. Basically, it's much easier to suspend my disbelief far enough to admit that perhaps our protagonist is a robot if dialogue states, Hey, turns out you're a robot! rather than if the protagonist has a speech in one game that has a robotic voice effect added, he survives an event that is explained to be survivable by means other than him being a robot, and that other thing had dialogue state, hey, it turns out you're a robot, to a different character. And you have to spend five years piecing that all together in a somewhat comprehensible way, and you're still not sure. My biggest annoyance with the novels are simply that it would have been so easy for details that don't create major inconsistencies between these novels and the games to have been adhered to. It would have been so easy! You wanna know how to accomplish it? Just don't create those inconsistencies! Like, for example, Silver Eyes revolves largely around the characters breaking into the abandoned building that once was Freddy Fazbear's Pizza years after it shut down, and with it a lot of very clear details about the layout of the building are presented. And spoiler alert, it's not the same as the games. I mean, let's assume that the location in the books is based more off of the first game since, you know, it is. In the first game, we have the main room, and that's where the stage is. It's where all the tables are. It can be assumed that somewhere off-camera there are arcade cabinets, like maybe right around here in between the entrances to the hallways, or maybe on this wall, you know, where the bathrooms are. In this corner of the same room is Foxy's stage. The only extensions to this main room are rooms off to the side, like the kitchen or the backstage area, or small hallway extensions used solely for bathrooms, custodial closets, and the security room. But the description of the floor plan is so much more elaborate in the books. Pirate's Cove is no longer just another stage in the main room, it's a completely separate room off of a long hallway. There are many described separate rooms, including ones for arcade cabinets. 
There's even a room designed similarly to the security room, except it's used to program the dancing of the animatronics, and it exists inside the actual stage, which is its own can of worms regarding if this hollowed out version of the stage would even be able to support the weight of the animatronics. My point is, the described floor plan of Freddy Fazbear's Pizza in the books is so much more different than anything we'd ever seen in the games, and that's kinda ridiculous. That's not something that should be hard to get correct, even if you just want more separate rooms for dramatic purposes. My current theory is that Scott Cawthon created the main layout of events of the story and commissioned Kira Breed Risley to make something readable out of it, which I understand, but at the same time, it doesn't just excuse my frustration with how easy it could have been to keep details from going all over the place. If Cawthon wanted the books to hold the details that would have revealed the secrets of the games, then it would have been easier to just have it occur the same way as the games. Charlie was killed by William Afton. Does she A. Possess the puppet and spend her afterlife trying to protect other kids, or B. Does she get rebuilt as an android? Both are correct, it just depends on if you got the game open or the book open. Mike Lafton was the son of William Afton. Does he exist? Well, yes and no. After all, both the games and the books are canon, just not to each other. You know what Circus Baby looks like? Good job, great memory. But you're also wrong because she's actually the same kind of human robot that is made out of flesh or something. Basically, it's the older version of Charlie, but programmed evil later. Basically, Mecha Harley Quinn. Toy animatronics, Funtime animatronics, Twisted animatronics, Nightmare animatronics. Some exist, some don't, some only exist in one, and some times I want to play with matches. For how important the books seem for allowing the suspension of disbelief in relation to how certain interpretations of the story of the games are considered possible, they seem to distance themselves way too much from the games, and f*** me if that's not frustrating. I feel like I'm being a bit rambly here, such that my issues may be met with a resounding, so what? And here's the rub. If even simple details, like the layout of a small building, can't be kept consistent, then it becomes downright impossible to truly come to a conclusion about which details are included in the novels with the intention of answering questions about the canon of the game, and which aren't. The reason I've been calling people's opinions of how the story goes interpretations rather than theories is mainly because picking and choosing what details in this series parallel details in the other canon is akin to translating a play from ancient Greek into English. Well, well this word sometimes means sun and, and sometimes means moon, so we have no way of knowing whether or not this scene takes place in the daytime. Does that mean that we should toss aside the books and never use them for learning what is going on? Well, there's one canon universe where we should, and one equally canon universe where we shouldn't. Good luck. And look at my Schrodinger's pussy. Now, other than the frustration I met with while trying to use the novels as a tool for dealing with the games, I actually like the novels a good bit. After all, they're meant to be read as their own standalone experience, and you're doing a disservice to them when you fail to read them at least once with that sentiment in mind. The relationships among the characters here are very fun to read, and I'm a huge sucker for teen or young adult melodrama, whether it be a fun horror like Final Destination 3, or a raunchy comedy like Superbad, or a quirky indie story like Life is Strange. A lot of the more horrific aspects from the Five Nights at Freddy's lore are played up, from the disturbing implications of death by killer robot, to the adult horror of losing your child. 
It's clear that Coffin and or Breed Risley had a lot of fun playing around with what the reader knew at any given moment while reading, throwing in plenty of foreshadowing and details hinting toward the bigger picture, all with the knowledge that whoever was reading has probably also seen the Five Nights at Freddy's game theory playlist several times over already and knew the gist of what the lore already had in store for us. I mean, if you're a casual Five Nights at Freddy's fan, I feel somewhat confident in saying that if you just tear your mind away from the games and pick up these books, you're probably going to have a really nice time reading them. So here we are. Five main games, a spin-off game, three novels, and two variety books, and we're closing in on the end of the year 2017. No new game trailer has been released, so it's well within plenty of people's line of assumption that the series is probably done, just gearing up for that movie deal to deliver a finished product. Except wait, it's December 4th and Coffin just released something. Oh. Well, that's nice, it's a cute little Atari-style game where you play as Freddy Fazbear delivering pizzas to children. Freddy Fazbear's Pizzeria Simulator. A nice little, a nice little, a nice little game. Begin tape. Leaving dead space. Three, two, one. The purpose of this game is to test the patience of the most dedicated of Five Nights at Freddy's fans. Begin audio prompt in 3, 2, 1. The Phantom animatronics were not actually hallucinations, they were reconstructed in Fazbear's Fright by Springtrap. Document results. Begin audio prompt in 3, 2, 1. The death of Crying Child in Five Nights at Freddy's 4 was actually a metaphor for the biblical tale of Cain and Abel. Document results. Begin audio prompt in 3, 2, 1. Purple Guy is actually... Sans Undertale. I don't know what any of these words mean. Freddy Fazbear's Pizzeria Simulator was the chronological finale to the Five Nights at Freddy's series, wherein you're implied to be playing as Michael Afton, purchasing a Freddy Fazbear's Pizza franchise sometime after Fazbear's Fright burned down. Throughout the game, you try to make your pizzeria as well presented as possible with your limited funds in order to attract as many children to your establishment as possible, though with the added task from a mysterious man to salvage any animatronics still active following the events of the first five main games. Those still active include Ennard, now under the guise of Molten Freddy, Circus Baby, now under the guise of Scrap Baby, William Afton, still trapped in a now more damaged spring trap suit, and the Puppet, who has been encapsulated by a containment animatronic known as Lefty. We learn that the mysterious man who instructed your actions is Henry, the founder of Fazbear Entertainment, father of Charlie, creator of the original animatronics, and vengeful business partner of William Afton. He burns the final Freddy Fazbear's pizza down, killing himself and Michael Afton, neutralizing the effects of the scooper, freeing Elizabeth Afton's remnant from Baby, Charlie's remnant from the puppet, and the remnants of the missing children from Ennard, and dooming William Afton to hell, all while finally liquidating Fazbear Entertainment and its assets. You probably have a lot of questions going in. Like, wait, the children's souls were in Ennard? Wait, why are Ennard and Baby two different characters again? And hold up, why the f*** does Springtrap look like that? Fire damage my ass, look at this piss bunny head ass. The children's souls were probably in Ennard, yeah. In the novels, the Funtime animatronics were made not only as specialized killing machines, they were also infused with remnant obtained from the original group of animatronics that were haunted by the missing children. 
the process of scooping or scalable creation of ulterior presence, directly injected the Funtime animatronics with Remnant and the children's souls were corrupted by the evil programming. Out of the new information introduced in this game, this is probably the most interesting, retconning a sci-fi explanation for the paranormal events of the games in a way that seems to fit within the rules built within the lore very early on, and it makes the character of Ennard, or Molten Freddy, much cooler. The explanation for why Circus Baby is no longer a part of Ennard is a lot less satisfying. You see, over the months before the release of the game, the source code of Scott Cawthon's websites revealed a conversation between Circus Baby and Ennard. You're crowding us! Be quiet. You can't tell us what to do anymore! Yes, I can. You will do everything that I tell you to do. <laughs> we outnumber you! That doesn't matter, dummy. We found a way to inject you! You would be lost without me. Ha <laughs> Say goodbye to our friend! I can put myself back together. There is zero trace of any mention of this interaction in the actual game, so all that fans have to work off of is the fact that two promotional websites happened to have the integral piece of information required to justify a character's appearance in the game hidden in the fucking source code for a brief moment of time during which the fan base was not as active due to a lack of extra prevalent teasers. That's fucking dumb. Thematically, it does make sense that Ennard and Baby had this interaction. As we established, Ennard was the amalgamation of the five souls of the missing children. These souls were not evil, merely corrupted by William Afton's programming. Elizabeth Afton, however, reveals at the end that she was a corrupted soul, hoping to continue her father's work by a more personal corruption, no doubt furthered by Baby's programming. Anard ejecting Baby represented the innocent souls removing a corrupt soul. It's possible that this also connects back to Baby requesting Michael Afton remove the good parts of her before she became part of Ennard, meaning we're only seeing her bad parts and the good parts of her did exist, and perhaps Michael Afton had that microchip pocketed when he burned. Who knows? I also really like Scrap Baby's process when putting herself back together. The character design is full of tiny details relating back to the scenery of Circus Baby's entertainment and rental, including light fixtures from the circus control room, and I think it's fun to imagine her thought process when specifically choosing pieces that would be advantageous to her, like a huge f***ing claw arm and her roller skates. It's kind of annoying that all of the interesting character development for Ennard and Baby came after the game that was dedicated much more to them, and it's a defined flaw of the series to have important exposition exist solely in a minute, impermanent way. But other than that, I'm impressed with the executions of these characters in this game. Oh, and what was that last question? Oh yeah, what the f*** happened to Springtrap, man? Now... A lot of design choices here make sense. I won't act like they don't. It's obvious that in the fire, William Afton lost most of his arm, a large amount of his bunny ears, and a lot of his flesh rotted away, leaving behind bone. But the part of his design that utterly baffles me is the mascot's face. This snout is much more pronounced than the original model, and the teeth were replaced with giant buck teeth and spiny thorns. Let's just talk about the lore right now. Does this fit in the lore? No. This drastic change only has the potential to be explained canonically as the result of fire damage. But it goes without saying that- No baby! One could argue that perhaps Springtrap lost his mask in the fire and he retrieved a different one sometime between leaving Fazbear's Fright and returning outside Freddy Fazbear's Pizza, 
but that comes with the question of where he would find one after the objects inside all sustained so much fire damage, as well as when he would have really gotten the chance, as well as simply not needing it, because we see Springtrap at the end of Sister Location, and he is a damage to a point of needing to replace his mask with one that inexplicably is also damaged and has a completely different style. The only reason I can assume Coffin changed Springtrap's character design is to retcon his appearance outright in hopes that Springtrap would look closer to this in the movies, but more on that later. Even if we make it to a point where we do see Springtrap in the movies, I definitely wouldn't want him to look like this as opposed to his previous design. To put it simply, this is not a scary character design. Sure, it's disturbing to see William Afton so nonchalant about losing parts of his body, and to imagine him in a zombified state that prevents him from feeling pain anymore, but that's all in the implications, most of which we already felt with the Springtrap roaming Fazbear's Fright. This character design is fucking goofy, literally. Springtrap looks like a cartoon character now, and sure, that fits with the fact that he's designed for children's entertainment, but that designed for children's entertainment argument can go in the opposite way. Remember Mangle? Yeah, so much for entertaining children with that shit. Look at the animatronic form of Chuck E. Cheese. That thing is f***ing weird looking with his flat face and beady eyes. Are you implying that if Chuck E. Cheese existed as a hybrid form animatronic and mascot suit, then his facial features would contract enough that he would look like this when the spring locks are wound. Either way, this isn't the first time we've seen the same characters undergo changes that can't simply be explained by age or damage, but this is the worst of it that we have seen. And I haven't even started talking about gameplay. In the mainline series of Five Nights at Freddy's games, this is the most involved of them, and it's great. One half of Pizzeria Simulator features the most interesting task management game thus far in the series, providing elements based largely in luck such that spending too much time in that room is likely to doom you before too long, while focusing too much on your tasks without taking any time to detract your threats will also doom you, forcing you to learn a perfect balance that would allow you to win. We've seen similar mechanics in Sister Location, except mastery of the mechanics in Sister Location becomes arbitrary when you only complete those tasks once ever, while in this game mastery is key to victory. The other half is a fun tycoon game where you customize your pizzeria as you see fit, adding games and attractions and all kinds of stuff. You even get to playtest the arcade cabinet, creating a diegetic explanation for the lore minigames that in all other games kinda just happened. Speaking of lore, by God, is this the most satisfying game? Not only does it upfront tie all loose ends with its ending, removing ambiguity over any continuation past this point in the timeline, but it also includes all sorts of little hints tying up loose answers. One game shows the events leading to William Afton's first victim, Susie, who would go on to possess Chica. Another shows what seems to either be a parent's reaction to the kidnapping of Gabriel, Jeremy, or Fritz, or it shows William Afton, shown in gold here because he's no longer hiding in the shadows and he's not literally purple like his son, reacting to his younger son running away to possibly Fred Bear's family diner. I'm frustrated by this one still being a little ambiguous, but whatever, at this point either explanation doesn't destroy the plot. One more minigame visualizes the possession of the puppet by Charlie, and even one other reveals enigmatic stories of five dead children becoming one, hinting at the process of extracting the remnant of the missing children and putting them in Ennard. Molten, as an epithet, is a nice symbolic wink and a nudge on the backstory of this version of Freddy. What most people never really did realize is that hidden in even more subtle details are the explanations to some of the biggest questions to haunt the franchise. Like, what exactly are the details of this mysterious paragraph 4? 
Who exactly is the perpetrator of the Bite of 87? And what exact object lies within the lockbox at the end of Five Nights at Freddy's 4? After years of obsessing and decoding cryptic images and dialogue in the games in a much more critical manner than Matthew Patrick or Lewis Dawkins ever could hope to, I came to a definitive explanation for all these questions and more. It doesn't f***ing matter. I'm not saying this as a naysayer who wants to jerk off my ego to millions of people online by saying that spending time trying to understand a fictional story is stupid, quite the opposite. I'm saying this as someone who operated under the assumption for years that Scott Cawthon was some kind of mega uber genius who planned every single piece of the lore from day one, and it was with the development of my critical sense that I realized that Scott Cawthon is only a fucking human. He's one man telling a fun story that he was never sure would continue being told after any given chapter that he added. There's no way that learning specific details could reveal all about what is occurring within the storyline. In fact, if we did learn specific details, it's more likely that they would just create more plot holes, if anything. There is nothing that Cawthon could put into this lockbox that does not either contrive the plot to a point of incomprehension, or be one more piece of evidence supporting an ever-present theory about the series that has no chance of ever upending our understanding of this grand finale to the story, or the motivations of every character involved leading up to it. This lockbox is much more akin to J.J. Abrams' infamous mystery box than one can imagine. For those unfamiliar, director J.J. Abrams had a TED Talk in 2007 where he describes a childhood object that inspired some of his most impressive projects, including the television series Lost and the Cloverfield Film Universe. That object was a box, Tannen's Mystery Magic Box, advertised to be $50 worth of magician's props, sold for $15. Something that when he brought it home, he couldn't bring himself to open it and reveal to him the mystery of the mystery magic box. And it was this that inspired him to create mysterious stories that sprinkle clues of their events without being explicit about the motivations and origins of mysterious entities within those stories. Over the years, this talk has been a subject of controversy, criticized for attributing a false sense of wonder on something so otherwise useless, and for empowering a sort of ego-stroking on Abram's part. But the specific critique I have goes much further into the existential themes of this box and its use. The issue with this box is that it symbolizes the idea that Abrams can create a story that is completely incomprehensible, but insist that the answer to the mysteries in his work exist and is satisfying, but no one has been able to completely piece the clues together in quite the correct way, nor is he allowed to spell the answer out to the public because that would ruin the mystery, leaving people continuously scrambling for the answers they believe exist, but ultimately might as well not truly exist. It doesn't help Abram's case that the mystery magic box, as a product sold by magic shops, exists specifically to take various magic tricks that wouldn't sell and present them in a discount with an added allure. The mystery box, as an actual physical object and as a concept to represent Abrams' greatest stories, is a marketing gimmick. And on the exact same level, this lockbox, the infamously permanently locked toolbox, holds nothing more than tattered threads. Story threads broken by an insistence on selling another tale. Discussion threads torn by the impossibly confused interpretations 
tangled by the hands of those who claimed themselves fans of the series. Myself included. It's only now that I understand the depth of the depravity of this monster, this creature I unwillingly helped to create. As if what he'd already done wasn't enough, he found a new way to desecrate, to humiliate, to destroy. As if the suffering wasn't enough, the loss of innocence, the loss of everything to so many people, small souls trapped in prisons of my making, now set to new purpose and used in ways I never thought imaginable. We sweat the small stuff. As though even the tiniest bit of moisture can loosen those locks enough to spring open. Perhaps? No. Certainly. Some things are best left forgotten. Forever. Pizzeria Simulator was great, and... As bittersweet it was, I'm glad to see the story come to quite the close it did. Except it's not over! One more game! One more game! One more game! One more game! That's right! What good is a grand finale to the series without something to bring the whole cast of kooky characters together for one final hoorah? The biggest challenge to ever meet the previous victors of any high difficulty form of the last seven games. A game where you were given the opportunity to hold the fort on your security office for just one night against 58 of the biggest baddies, the baddest biggies, and a few assorted nuisances. Ladies and gentlemen, this is... Ultimate Custom Night. Yeah, he says that this is truly the ultimate, and he makes it as clear as possible, because we have been thinking every game would be the last one since the end of the trilogy. Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. Fool me for a sixth consecutive time, and you know what? This isn't worth it. I'm gonna go play Baldi's Basics. What a brilliant moment of fan service from a man who cared so much for said fans. This game serves as its own kind of scary that hasn't quite been done by any games in the series before it, nor have I seen it anywhere else before. The amount of tasks to accomplish at once in times of utter disorientation, all while balancing healthy amounts of disturbing implications. Where's my beak? Latched in your forehead, of course. <laughs> You're not so big. Just a butt-sized morsel. I found my guitar, now reach for the stars as I plunge it through your heart. Comedy. Arr, I came for you, booty. That be treasure, you know. You hear that? It's the sweet, sweet sound of your eternal silence! And lore. He's here and always lucky. The one he shouldn't have killed. I am remade, but not by you. By the one you should not have killed. That's right, more f***ing lore. So what does this game seem to represent? Well, since it wouldn't be possible to justify all of these characters together as an actual event to place in the timeline, especially since we see alternative versions of the same characters all walking around the same rooms, this is some kind of fantasy scenario. There's a couple predominant theories as to what is going on in this game. Some believe that you play as William Afton in Hell, and the one he should not have killed refers to Cassidy, the girl believed to haunt Fredbear as one of the original missing children, specifically the one killed on her happiest day, her birthday. 
Others believe you play as Michael Lafton in Hell. And the one he should not have killed refers to his younger brother in the jaws of Fredbear, something he has yet to atone for. Now, which story do I think it is? I believe you play as Scott Cawthon. Hear me out. I swear it makes sense. You play as Scott Cawthon, and the one he should not have killed refers simply to Fredbear and the ambiguity itself. This seems to be Cawthon atoning for the fact that he left the identity of the ghost haunting as Fredbear split between two likely candidates. Another question created by the overcomplication of the plot we saw in Five Nights at Freddy's 4. This even explains the deliberate casting for a voice that sounds like a boy or a girl. You can apply the idea of you playing as Cawthon to all references of the characters being created by the player. I am the fearful reflection of what you have created. I am your wickedness made flesh. Don't you hate getting killed by obscure secondary characters? or the smallest of details that seem to hint that the fourth wall is intended to be broken or nod at critiques from previous games. I hope you enjoyed the grand finale. I guess you forgot about me. Please deposit five coins. That last one only comes across as appropriate when you realize Coffin made the last couple games in the series completely free. Thus, he probably started feeling self-conscious about using Freddy as a tool for milking money out of the fans. Either way, nearly every part of this game feels like another extra meta piece specifically designed to play with Cawthon's connection to the series at this point, and it feels most satisfying and poetic to me to imagine it representing the last loose end that Cawthon can never tie up. Now that we've established what this game represents from a story standpoint, this is one of my favorite moments from the series at all. Seeing all of my favorite characters in one place was already enough for me to be excited, but when voices were added to characters who have been mute for years, a brand new appreciation is built. Funny enough, voices were added nearly exclusively to characters I had not enjoyed up to this point including the FNAF 2 and 4 characters, as well as the animatronics that you set on your stage in Pizzeria Simulator without a second thought. And I'll be honest, these voices all improve the experience largely. Before, I would have talked shit about Nightmare Fredbear's stomach mouth and how ridiculous he seems, but his voice is so gnarly. We know who our friends are, and you are not one of them. That mixture of creepy adult and innocent child that suddenly Nightmare Fredbear has become one of my all-time favorite characters. Before, I would have talked shit about Withered Bonnie's missing face because that's such a stupid thing to just leave sitting in the storage room like that, but now he has this cool robo voice and he makes jokes about his missing face. Might as well face the facts. You were always destined to forget. Who the f even is Mr. Hippo? He's genuinely the star of Ultimate Custom Night, surprising everyone with special non-conventional post-mortem voice lines where he goes on five minute tangents trying to find a footing in his story. Ice cold lemonade. Ooh, you ever mix it with iced tea? You do like a little half lemonade, half, oh, it's so, you should try it some, well, you can't because you're dead, but anyways. And it adds so much to the humor and the atmosphere that Cawthon was going for. The only places I feel the game kind of faltered were to whom they didn't give a voice and also the lack of variation between cutscenes. I was really excited to hear the main man's voice itself when I learned this game was going to be heavy with the voice acting, but when the game came out, the original Freddy, Bonnie, and Chica were all mute, as well as the original Springtrap, plus a bunch of characters that either don't need to talk or don't kill you and thus don't have the clear chance to. 
it just feels kind of dirty to play us with all these voices from other characters, but when it comes to these big characters that have served as some of the greatest iconography of the series, we get nothing. It feels incorrect. It feels wrong. Maybe he's saving their voices for the movies, which would be cool. It'd be great. I can't wait for that. But until then, I'm just salty because I want to hear my boy Springtrap. Get that afting crap out my face. He looks so doofy. Give my boy a voice, yo. The other small nitpick I have are the cutscenes you're rewarded with for winning at certain point increments. Both of them seem to be anime inspired, which isn't bad on its own, though definitely not my cup of tea, and both are just the same two cutscenes played ad nauseum, with a few small changes in the images shown to add a sort of continuity to them. After the first two, I felt like we kinda got the point and would have killed for some kind of variation. A lot of people think that there are hints at the lore hidden in these cutscenes, but I can't find it in myself to honestly believe that. They're just so bizarre. It seems clear to me that Cawthon wanted to just give us something to have fun with. Oh, oh, the bear is Henry, and the fox is Afton, and the bear is constantly trying to defeat the fox, but the fox keeps thwarting his plans, just like Afton. Bullsh**. No, no. Bullsh**. Like, it's one thing to say that you're reading too deep, but you're also just wrong because Henry's involvement for stopping Afton only ever went as far as putting security measures in the toy animatronics and then doing the stuff in Pizza Simulator. This fox and bear stuff is just fun sh**. So sit back and just have some f***ing fun! 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 Sometimes, uh, you know, sometimes a story is just a story. If you try to read into every little thing and find meaning in everything anyone says, you'll just drive yourself crazy. I had a friend do it once. Wasn't pretty. We talked about it for years. And not only that, but you'll likely end up believing something you shouldn't believe and thinking something you shouldn't think or, or assuming something you shouldn't assume, you know? Oh wow, I, uh, I can't believe I made it. <laughs> I trudged all the way through Scott Cawthon's series. Everything he directly built with his own hands. Fellas, from here on, what I have to talk about may have involvement from Cawthon, but will not be considered created by him in quite the same way. So now that we're right where we are, I want to reflect. Eight games. How were they? They're nice. Sure, throughout this whole process, I've been nitpicky, but that's only because I have a vested interest. I really, truly have been spending these past five years deeply considering what the story is, how the timeline works, and giving myself the chance to be heavily critical with how the story is told allowed me to get there, and I hope it did the same for a lot of you. At the end of the day, I I'm really glad to have something like this to talk about because it really does feel like something that I can talk about forever. All of these games, even the ones I list as forgettable or a low point, will forever be a part of the series. And for all of its faults, I can't act like the whole series is not something I hold close to my heart. So, I like it. I really do. Even the ones I don't like. And now that I've given my thoughts on the projects Cawthon has helmed, I want to give my sincere thanks to him for creating Five Nights at Freddy's. Why the f*** is it called Five Nights at Freddy's? The main plot of the first game has five nights that take place at Freddy Fazbear's Pizza? Then why are there also sixth and seventh nights? That first game is seven nights at Freddy's. Same with the second game, Five Nights at Freddy's 3. More like six nights in a spook house dedicated to Freddy's. What even is this fourth game? 
Eight Nights at Some Kid's Bedroom? That title disgusts me! Five Nights at Babies! Five Lunch Rush Shifts at Freddy's! There ain't a single game that follows this title and this has bothered me since the very first clickbait Let's Play video showing surprise over a sixth night hit YouTube! And the most egregious example of bad titling in these games goes to Five Nights at Freddy's VR Help Wanted. Because, while descriptions of the game online will tell you that you play as a mechanic hired at Freddy Fazbear's Pizza, the virtual reality of the situation is that you play as a beta tester for the Fazbear Virtual Experience, which is the in-universe title of the game. The best I could come up with when it comes to why Help Wanted appears in the title is that it represents the new job opening in the game development branch of Fazbear Entertainment after Jeremy died or was fired or something. You see, as I described, in Help Wanted, you play as, well, you. Just like you're playing a virtual reality video game, so too is our protagonist. I have a side tangent I want to go on in a minute, but I want this to be fresh in your mind while I develop the context. Basically, you know how in our universe, the Five Nights at Freddy's video game series exists, but Freddy Fazbear's Pizza doesn't. Well, in the universe of Help Wanted, Freddy Fazbear's Pizza does exist, but so does the Five Nights at Freddy's video game series. And in order to hide the shady past of the company, Fazbear Entertainment sued Scott Coffin for slandering a trademarked brand. Except, plot twist, Coffin was actually commissioned by Fazbear Entertainment to create the Five Nights at Freddy's series in order to delegitimize the stories of tragedy in the company. And to further save face, they decided to recreate the games in a way that's intended to laugh off these so-called urban legends and myths. However, one employee, named Jeremy, discovers the legitimacy of the stories Coffin published and is then silenced by Fazbear Entertainment. A woman on the QA team at Fazbear Entertainment then leaves audio files in the game for people to find, documenting her suspicions for the circumstances in which Jeremy had disappeared, as well as her discovery of a dangerous piece of malware infesting itself as a yellow rabbit mascot that is intending to use the game as a means of escaping this digital prison by possessing the body of the player, which in the context of the game is our protagonist. Before I start unwrapping the story further, I just want to mention how absurd it is that so many virtual reality games are built around the plot of you, the player, playing as a character that is playing a virtual reality game. You see this in virtual Rickality, but more so as a joke referencing a scene in the cartoon Rick and Morty, but this is also the main plot in Super Hot, Duck Season, Accounting, Job Simulator, and now Help Wanted. It's just bizarre to me how virtual reality is already criticized as a trendy novelty, yet development studios are so uncomfortable with the prospects of proving them wrong by expanding the horizons for contexts that games are meant to be set in. My current theory is that so many virtual reality games contextualize their plot in virtual reality themselves because with current technology, the scales tip more toward virtual than they do reality, and so the virtual reality games are explained to take place in virtual reality games with cheap graphics work to sidestep the fact that their graphics don't look completely real. It's not our fault the graphics don't look good. This is just the look we're going for designed to poke fun at virtual reality games with graphics that don't look good. And while all of that may suggest that I don't think the graphics in that list of virtual reality games don't look good, I couldn't give a crap, personally. I'm no traditional gamer by any means, but as someone who grew up with access to the internet, I know plenty of aspects of gamer lifestyles, and I know that a lot of gamers are so dedicated to games because their escapist fantasies, they're good for escaping the stress of real life. 
Side note, if you're not careful, that sentiment can also, for some bizarre reason, grow into thinly failed misogyny and racism, but I digress. My point is, photorealism is commonly praised in the graphics of newly released games thanks to the desire of escapism that gamers have, which melds very poor with their unfortunate lack of suspension of disbelief. What I'm saying is, in the current culture of video games, there's a huge push for developers to present the player with something that seems more realistic to the eyes, and I think there are some studios that feel threatened by this push, and in order to make up for the lack of time, energy, or technology, and thus to make up for any lapses in realism, I can imagine the decision to augment a sense of patchwork in those lapses by grounding the story in a situation where lapses in realism should and would exist. But hey, that's just- Help Wanted serves as a virtual reality port of the first five main games in the series. My assumption is that very little content from Pizzeria Simulator made it into this game simply because this game is meant to take place before that game since the Fazbear Virtual Experience is created by Fazbear Entertainment, which, if you'll remember, got liquidated by the end of the week that Pizzeria Simulator takes place in. The first three games are recreated almost exactly, and I gotta say, it's absolutely wonderful. One of my biggest nitpicks of the first three games is that a lot of the gameplay mechanics didn't really make sense if you ever tried to envision it as it was really happening. Like how the enemies could more or less be soft -locked just by looking at them or keeping your monitor up or anything like that. It never ruined the experience, but it's very satisfying to see those games remade in a way that says, oh, here's what was literally going on while you played. Because of these changes in game mechanics, it makes the entire experience feel so much more involved, which really only would have been accomplished in virtual reality, so I'm glad that happened. It's also so much more horrific to see everything go down in greater detail. You can see Bonnie and Chica walk by your doors, you can see the Five Nights 2 animatronics make their way toward your room, and can hell Springtrap my fucking boy, seeing him crawl down that fucking vent is insane. It's kind of a sad give and take scenario because instead of those horrifying jump scares of old where Springtrap approaches you with a mix of curiosity and menace, you get to see him crawl with disgusting deliberateness and pain towards you. If he happens to make it in those two vents. Either way, both the remakes of these games as well as their originals hold their own strengths and weaknesses and all of it is great. Let's move past the trilogy. Five Nights at Freddy's 4 saw a significant snuffing from this game, because instead of an exact recreation of the game, the setting was reused for a series of mini-games called Night Terrors. Also, Plush Trap and Nightmare BB are back in their own mini-games. I honestly can't remember if I've mentioned them ever this entire review. And I think that's appropriate because they were also the most forgettable and unnecessary part of Five Nights 4. Night Terror served as a crossover between Five Nights 4 and Sister Location, where in one game you ward off Funtime Freddy in the same way you would Nightmare Bonnie and Nightmare Chica while dealing with distractions from Bon Bon and Bonnet. In another, you play the same game with Nightmare Ione, and in another, the same game with Nightmare Fredbear. And in a completely different version of the game, you hide in the closet from Circus Baby. I guess playing the game with the entire Nightmare cast at once would have just been too much of a hassle to get through, and it would have given Funtime Freddy and Circus Baby a lack of their own games to recreate, since neither have any mechanics in previous games that really work in virtual reality at all. Funtime Foxy didn't quite get snuffed in the same way. In fact, his minigame serves as the only recreation from Sister Location that made it into this game, because not only was it the only minigame from Sister Location that made any sense in virtual reality, it actually is improved 
improved greatly by virtual reality. There's something so satisfying about playing this scary version of Pin the Tail on the Donkey in what feels like an actual room with space and texture. Even Ennard needed to find a completely different way into this virtual reality recreation, and they did so with one of the best minigames in the entire game, one that was completely unique to Help Wanted, although is assumed to occur during the events of Sister Location between nights 4 and 5. Other than Funtime Foxy, absolutely no part of Sister Location's actual gameplay makes an appearance in Help Wanted, except, in a way... One of the biggest highlights of the game is the animatronic repair minigames, where you are read a series of tasks by hand unit, which you must follow very precisely to make repairs to Bonnie, Chica, Freddy, then Foxy. It's so cool to see the original four so goddamn up close and personal. My only gripe is that there's not a lot of replayability with these repair minigames. I I button button tune, I I button button. Pizza, 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 button, 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 cupcake, arm, button, cupcake, pizza. Hat, hat, bow tie, wax, box, button, shoot, box, box, nose. Mask, fuse, 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 eye. Unless they update the game to have new variety in the repair mini games, those instructions will never ever change. And unless you're interested in speedrunning, this will kill the replay factor for you. But then again, in order to replay the game, you would have had to play it in the first place. And bro, the game that was initially released to the public was borderline unplayable. This was the first time in the series where a game had been released with a significant number of game-breaking bugs, and it's very frustrating. You can watch any YouTuber play through this game, and each one of them struggled through the sections dedicated to the first three games in the series, because sometimes an animatronic shows up in a camera, when in reality, they're somewhere completely different. Sometimes they just completely disappear, except for when they jump scare you, that is. The only game-breaking glitch that wasn't just the animatronics turning invisible and being impossible to defeat, was this glitch that froze Funtime Freddy in place. It's useful to get a free win with no risk of a game over, but it's still a glitch I failed to wrap my head around. I know making a game is difficult, and I have to imagine virtual reality certainly does no favors, but it's frustrating to see difficulty created solely by the fact that there is a glitch that completely dismantles the core or mechanics of the game. See, the funniest part about that rant is that as valid as it was, I never even played this game because I don't have a virtual reality system. Ha! Pranked ya. For this game specifically, I've just been using the documentations of YouTubers for my research. And strangely enough, as much as these glitches impede on the ability to play the game, they all kept a positive attitude. I don't know if that's more telling of the artificial nature of Let's Players Online, or if these glitches really don't feel all that intrusive, but if it's the former, consider me the voice for all of those too scared to say it, these glitches were atrocious! This in no way means that the whole experience of the game was ruined. It just means that this game needed a lot more bug testing and time to fix before release. And it unfortunately did not have that. Or, who knows? Maybe the glitches were intentional to show that Fazbear Virtual Experience was still in beta, and it wasn't actually Help Wanted that's full of glitches, it's the virtual reality game within the virtual reality game that's full of glitches. Ya bitches. Let's talk about the yellow rabbit suit guy. Yeah, the f**k's up with that, bro. A lot of people would probably interpret this guy as the ghost of William Afton trying to possess your character, but honestly I can't figure out how that would work in the timeline since the only way for this game to fit in would be for it to exist during a time where William Afton was still mummified in the Springtrap suit. Remember, this couldn't have taken place after Pizzeria Simulator because Fazbear Entertainment hasn't been liquidated yet, and the only elements from that game that are referenced here are Helpy and Scrap Baby Plush. 
and Helpy was probably used by the company for a while before Simulator, and rumors of a dilapidated version of Circus Baby wandering Hurricane Utah probably would have made it to Fazbear Entertainment sometime before Simulator. How else would Henry have known about her current state? Maybe our glitch trap here represents Jeremy or the voice we hear on the tapes credited as QA, but I don't know, that doesn't seem to fit the lore of the tapes, but then again, Glitchtrap could be the programmed consciousness of either of the other two Jeremys in the series, because, yeah, Coffin did it again. Two bites, two purple guys, two golden freddies, and three Jeremys. All I can really tell you is that it either just is what it is at surface level, a hack created by the corrupt Fazbear Entertainment, which doesn't seem fully plausible to me because while they're very shady about hiding their controversial past, I don't think they would then actively try to have kids possessed by a ghost hack. Or, and you could call me overly cynical here, but I think that Glitchtrap is nothing. A big old batch of nothingness. Glitchtrap is not an actual threat, it's just a creepy thing to throw into the game. The stakes surrounding the character is that if you fail to subdue him, he will possess the character playing the Fazbear Virtual Experience, which you can immediately undo by returning to menu. You, the actual player, don't get possessed by a hat. The form it takes as the same yellow rabbit that lured kids into the back room is exactly what Fazbear Entertainment would throw in to poke more fun at the quote-unquote myth of the man who killed five kids and stuffed their corpses into the animatronics. I know a lot of people are going to feel somewhat hurt by the idea that this lore is really just lore and that's it. But hey, it's not like they don't spell it out for you that this is a fictional scenario. <laughs> I'm sorry, but... Honestly, with the state of the timeline, this is the only explanation that makes any sense to me. Glitchtrap isn't a secret ghost or a demon or a hack that will go out and kill more kids. It's just Fazbear Entertainment playing along with the urban legend. When you find Slenderman in Slender the Eight Pages, you don't contract Operator's illness the instant you see static fill your screen because this graphic of Slenderman isn't Slenderman. He's a tribute to the urban legend. And if I'm being honest, the best form of any kind of meaning that could be gleaned from this game comes from this interpretation specifically. Do you know how many times fans have been so obsessed with uncovering the lore of the series that they have, swear to god, harassed small pizzeria businesses on a hunch, thinking that Scott Cawthon had chosen them to represent THE Freddy Fazbear's Pizza? It's a sad truth, but there's a lot of people who look at Five Nights at Freddy's and fail to separate fact from fiction, and they prepare themselves for a pilgrimage to Freddy Fazbear's Pizza, failing to understand that it doesn't exist in our universe. Now we have a game that appears to say, Actually, Freddy Fazbear's Pizza does exist, and Five Nights at Freddy's was created on behalf of the actual company. At this point, a lesson needs to be learned. That lesson being that these games do not represent anything in the real world. A story is just a goddamn story. And sadly, I'm probably more or less completely wrong with this interpretation, but frankly, I just find way too many plot holes in the others. Aside from the minigames, you can also unlock a gallery, where you can more closely observe the animatronics in all their glory. You can earn prizes in the prize counter, which you can play with. You can access the aforementioned lore through a cassette tape room thing, and you can activate Showtime. For about four and a half years, I had been waiting to hear the voice of Freddy Fazbear, the ever-elusive crooning of the big robot bear. And as a reward for our wait, we don't just get the voice of Freddy, we get a whole damn performance with Bonnie and Chica. Except wait, no you don't! Because Scott decided last minute that the VR port wasn't where Freddy deserved to have his voice flung. Plus our indecisive coffin probably wasn't fully happy with the voice Kellen Goff performed in. Heck if I know. Heck, I don't care. I'll voice the big bad if I have to. 
You have been teasing me for five years. I just want him to have a voice. And while you're at it, please give the original Springtrap a voice. Oh, and also, why the f would you need to introduce Plush Baby as an enemy that serves as a group-based sidekick to Circus Baby? Then you could have just used the f***ing Bitty Babs! Ooh. Ha! Oh! Woo! Nine fucking games. I did it! We're done! Except wait! <laughs> it's not finished! I'm not done yet! <laughs> Look at how much time is left, baby! So much more time left! <laughs> Before we do actually wrap this up, I want to touch upon two points that are both extremely important to Five Nights at Freddy's. The fan content and the future of the series. The fan content for Five Nights at Freddy's is quite expansive. Of course, there's fan art and fan fiction that comes with nearly every package deal for fan bases, but Five Nights at Freddy's opted for the premier service, including fan games and fan music. The fan games are extremely extensive. Many expansive, many impressive, and some are terrible. A lot of the first few fan games to be hit with the series came much closer to simply ripping off the success of Five Nights. Some pretty much operated as game jacks, expositing that, Hey, you know how Freddy Fazbear's Pizza is running on hard times because it's been hit with tragedy? Well, this other pizzeria with animatronics that just so happens to be right across the street is also being hit by child murderers. I never understood that trope, and you find it in so many Five Nights at Fan games. It's pretty much like taking an established urban legend like, We don't own a clown statue? And then adding, And neither do the neighbors! Five Nights at Candy's is a good example of this at the start, but because it came fairly early to the scene of FNAF fan games, it was also decently popular, and that popularity meant sequels, and in those sequels, it gave itself the opportunity to develop its own lore. Kinda like Daisy Brown, except you have to push more buttons on your keyboard. Another trend with early Five Nights at Freddy's fan games was taking existing intellectual properties and giving them their own FNAF spin. There was an obligatory Five Nights at Chuck E. Cheese's, Five Nights at Wario's, plus a couple Spongebob themed ones, Five Nights at the Krusty Krab and Five Nights at the Chum Bucket. These games will either try their best to implement existing images of these characters and choppily animate them into a jump scare, or they'll try building models that vaguely look like the characters. These always made the games look pretty shoddy, and when you add that to the rushed game designing process with these older game jackings, the games themselves were usually broken beyond repair and nearly unplayable. Interestingly enough, the rise in popularity of Five Nights at Freddy's coincided with the decline in popularity of creepypastas, so some of these early games have heavy influence from existing creepypasta characters. The most famous example of this is Five Nights at Treasure Island, which took inspiration from the creepypasta Abandoned by Disney. These games aren't always great, what can I say? As time went on, it became more common to see more original concepts tried out in fan games taking inspiration from FNAF. One Night at Flumpty's is a more comedic approach to the original Five Nights at Freddy's, completely animated and featuring one long, difficult level, as well as a sequel with even more new ideas. The Joy of Creation is my, and probably everyone's, favorite example of a good FNAF fan game. This game focuses largely on presenting the enemies, lifted from Five Nights at Freddy's 2, as killing machines. The terror you feel comes largely from how violent the characters are, stomping loudly as they chase after you, screaming an extremely effective jump scare sound, and even going so far as to punch you in the nose with such ferocity. <laughs> God damn, this is a good one. I know I'm kind of glossing over these fan games a bit too much for some people, and that's mainly because I've already spent months of my life trying to give detailed reviews of the actual Five Nights at Freddy's series. I don't want to turn this into a pick and choose scenario where I'm also going into great detail over games I already never cared too much for. Did you know that there are literally thousands of Five Nights at Freddy's fan games? Yeah, no, this is not what I'm dedicating my life to. 
I hope it's satisfying enough to say that I, as a fan of Five Nights at Freddy's, appreciate the existence of these fan games from people who had the time and skill to put in a little work to show appreciation for a series that they, as well as I, enjoy. Now on to the fan music. This is the craziest aspect of the Five Nights at Freddy's phenomenon to me because it's quite possibly the most culturally influential part. On August 31st, 2014, The Living Tombstone created a song based on the hidden lore of the original Five Nights at Freddy's game, depicting the animatronic antagonists as the lost, despairing souls of the children who were revealed to have been murdered in the game's easter eggs. The sense of sympathy the listener builds for the subject of the song, as well as the extremely catchy pop rhythm and the melody held to the video skyrocket in popularity to a point where it currently stands around 150 million views, being the most viewed video relating to Five Nights at Freddy's ever. This was big, really big, and with anything big quite like this, there will be imitators. Soon enough, pretty much every nerdcore artist ever was making Five Nights at Freddy's songs. Some were great, some were bad, and some were so bad that they've been deleted. YouTuber Etra Games has a great video going into better detail about this, link in description, but it's this fan music trend that contributed largely to what he calls the chain base, where in Five Nights at Freddy's, as well as around a dozen of other video games, were smash hits online with more or less the same fan base. Ever since the huge success of fan music for Five Nights at Freddy's, games such as Bendy and the Ink Machine, Hello Neighbor, Baldi's Basics, Doki Doki Literature Club, Undertale, and Tattletale, which yes, is still trash, had similar success largely due to musical tie-ins. Of these, two of them are extra noteworthy examples. Undertale was created by Toby Fox, who had previously gained notoriety as a musician for the webcomic Homestuck, created by Andrew Hussey, a job that he earned by making covers of already created Homestuck songs. This timeline is around five years older than Five Nights at Freddy's, so I'm obviously not going to act like FNAF is the cause of this. Rather, I'd like to just put forth that after the release of Undertale, the Five Nights at Freddy's fan music timeline definitely merged in with the Undertale fan music timeline. I just think it's cool that these two different events can just happen with such timing as to cause such an unstoppable force of internet culture. The other most interesting example is Bendy and the Ink Machine, created by The Meatly, wherein every one of the five chapters has a hidden music box that plays a rendition of different fan songs, specifically Bendy and the Ink Machine song by Kyle Allen, Build Our Machine by DA Games, Bendy and the Ink Musical by Random Encounters, Can't Be Erased by JT Music, and Lonely Angel, I'll Be Your Angel by Lauren Singer. It's impressive to imagine that not only would these songs probably not exist if it wasn't for the impact Five Nights at Freddy's fan music had on the internet, but similarly the games that these songs are based on probably wouldn't have been quite as popular. And with that, let's move on to the future of the series. As of the moment I'm writing this, video games related to Five Nights at Freddy's that have been announced by Cawthon as being in development include an augmented reality game, as in a game that utilizes your cell phone's camera to put the characters in your own real environment, similar to Pokemon Go, as well as a triple A game. This AAA game, and especially this augmented reality game, are very exciting to me, and I'll probably take the opportunity to review both of them in a later video once they've all been released. There's also talks of more books, including another series of novels. Maybe I'll bundle those in with those other games. What I most want to dedicate this part of the discussion to is the movie. Possibly movies. The basics surrounding the production are pretty well known by now, but for those who don't know, Warner Brothers originally got the rights in 2015, and we're going to have Gil Keenan, director of Monster House and the Poltergeist remake, direct a film adaptation of Five Nights at Freddy's. Keenan seemed to have been putting a lot of effort into it, and even seemed to be excitedly overseeing creation of the animatronics that would be used in the films, which was being done in Jim Henson's Creature Shop. However, updates eventually ran thin until 
until finally in 2017, it was revealed that rights had been traded to Blumhouse Studios. Now the Five Nights at Freddy's movie was confirmed to have Jason Blum and Scott Cawthon as producers, as well as having Chris Columbus attached to direct and produce. There's a lot of exciting things to unpack from this alone. For one, Chris Columbus as director is great. He's very well defined as a director. We all know his work in Home Alone and Harry Potter, but he was a producer on one specific film that makes this choice a director perfect. Night at the Museum. Yeah, who better to adapt the story about attractions coming to life at night to terrorize the night guard than the guy who's done it before? I'm also glad to know that Cawthon is holding such a strong role in production and that specifically Jason Blum is the head honcho in charge. Jason Blum is someone who seems to just hold a genuine love for filmmaking and providing opportunities for people to make something in their vision, because more often than not, that ends up resulting in the most interesting films. Scott Cawthon has been famously particular about how people involved publicly treat the information he gives them as well as the details of the plot. So knowing that he has a leading role in providing a screenplay for this movie gives me plenty of hope that this will be a very faithful adaptation. Speaking of Cawthon's role with the screenplay, one important aspect of how he wants these films to play out was brought up in his interview with Lewis Dawkins, specifically that his hope is for a trilogy of movies. And to keep the plot of this trilogy from spiraling out of control, he would limit plot influence between games and movies to simply be from the first three games. And you know what? F***ing good! I mentioned before that Five Days at Freddy's 4 was the moment that the game's plots got way too complicated to fully enjoy as a story to tell and analyze, and instead it had to be analyzed on the front of many different interpretations, something that didn't really happen with the first three games. Every question we had about the first three games felt like they had answers, while all we had to answer our questions in the later games was a locked box. Great. 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 It's somewhat rewarding to recognize Five Nights at Freddy's as a sort of trilogy in the games based on when it was possible to absorb a simple story within them only for the films to confirm this. Although, that's only if we see those three films. I have some concerns that this Five Nights at Freddy's film franchise won't have quite enough cultural power to carry itself in the box office long enough for Blumhouse to justify funding for a third film. And frankly, that would be pretty disappointing to me. Of what we'll get to see in these films, what I'm most excited for is to see how they interpret a live action spring trap. Will they go all out with the body horror? My excitement for the third film has gone so far as to imagine sequences of the film as I would most hope to see it. Like I get so excited to imagine the climax of that third film to show two different events concurrently, the death of William Afton in the suit, as well as the burning of the suit in the fire of Fazbear's Fright. The parallel imagery that you could imagine between the character burning down the building and the children ghosts converging on Afton. How cool cool would it be if the two scenes were shot with the same angles and motion and they were edited together seamlessly? It looks so much cooler in my head than it would in the actual movie, and that actual movie may never exist unless certain pieces all fall into place. And I got you some pro tips to make it work. Pro tip number one, make it PG. I'm not even joking here. There's not a lot of great family-friendly horror movies out there. Poltergeist is one, Monster House, Coraline, good one, Jurassic Park, I guess, and Five Nights at Freddy's would be a perfect one for this generation. I've seen a lot of general apprehension toward the idea of having horror movies limited in what they can show because it was given a rating that allows younger people to watch it, and usually, yeah, that's a bit of a problem, but not for Five Nights at Freddy's, which excels in making horror out of tame things and implications. When I was a kid, the T-Rex skeleton scene in Night at the Museum was extremely scary, and I've always loved that movie, including that scene. What was it rated? PG. Yeah, I know, it wasn't exactly a horror movie, but that horror scene is a good sneak peek of what kind of stuff we could see from Columbus, even if he only served as a producer for that film, and how the ideas from Five Nights at Freddy's could be accomplished in PG. Also, it kind of goes without saying, but a large amount of Five Nights at Freddy's fan base are kids. Simple fact. 
if this movie was rated R, you would be keeping a large part of the fan base away, and the movie may end up only watched by me, MatPat, Markiplier, and Daco. Maybe the sequels could have a higher rating, just to loosen up if you want to make Springtrap gorier, but other than that, this first movie should probably be PG, PG-13 at most. Pro tip to, be careful with these rewrites of the script. Apparently, Cawthon has thrown out like a dozen different scripts for this movie, some written by himself, some written by others, but either way, if anyone on this film is watching, be careful that ideas don't intermingle too much to a point where it becomes incomprehensible without anyone stopping to make the ideas work together. Now, I don't know if this is just how Hollywood works, and even good movies are subject to a lot of rewrites, but usually when there's any news of script rewrites, it's a warning sign of a bad movie. I've only ever heard stuff about numerous script rewrites from bad movies. So, just be careful. Make sure the script fully makes sense and can take on the full brunt of scrutiny from any nitpicky asshole, present company included. Pro tip 3. Be nice to the fans. Don't throw in too many new plot details that not only add confusion to the movies, but add confusion to the games. And maybe throw in some nice easter eggs to make the fans happy. Maybe a cameo from Markiplier or Daco or MatPat. Maybe have the Living Tombstone make an original song for the credits or something. None of these will add to the actual substance or quality of the films, but it would definitely raise excitement, make for some nice clickbait article titles, and ultimately satisfy enough fans to make them want to go see the movie, helping it make enough money to justify a sequel. It's a Blumhouse movie, so it probably doesn't have a crazy huge budget, but that shouldn't destroy the production by any means, and it should likewise make the amount of money needed to justify a sequel much smaller. Once you reach that point, all you can do is hope that 1. You can make that trilogy you want to make, and 2. The movies are good. Seriously, please make the movies good. I want to have a happy disposition when I get around to reviewing them. And with that, I have finally run out of things to talk about. Except for one. While I was writing this review, I stumbled on an article announcing the gradual eradication of the animatronic band in Chuck E. Cheese locations. When I saw this and noticed that it had been in effect since 2017, it came with a feeling of shock and nostalgic despair. It turns out interest in the robotic animals was waning among children. And the company had to acknowledge that kids were simply too frightened by these characters to be entertained by them. My concern was for a double-edged sword. The appeal of Five Nights at Freddy's since its humble beginnings was the existence of Chuck E. Cheese locations housing uncanny animatronics with campfire stories to boot. Without the robots... The cultural relevance of the most essential part of the premise are gone. The company had to acknowledge that kids were simply too frightened by the characters to be entertained by them. The timing is hard to view as a coincidence. After all, in the words of Matthew Patrick... Scott doesn't do coincidences. Five Nights at Freddy's has entered a time where the elements of reality that led to its relevance are set to be lost to the annals of recreational history. And its fate was sealed by its own hand. This announcement brought to the realization that it was, unfortunately, inevitable. No matter what, this franchise was going to be its own undoing by just this manner. It's impressive, really. Quite the bittersweet badge of honor. To say that it was so successful, it doomed itself. I recognize, of course, that it's silly to expect the company to keep itself on a track of lesser monetary success because I feel entitled to one day show my children an artifact of my own memories. 
all good things must come to an end. Of course they should. It's a downer to know that future generations will be missing ideas that would contribute to the ability to enjoy this piece of pop culture quite to the same degree that I do. But such is life. I was 14 years old when the first game was released. It's difficult to not hold a strong fondness for anything that pulled so much of your intrigue during your formative years. Five Nights at Freddy's was a phenomenon in the clearest sense of the word. A group of elements that came together in the right place at the right time. Lightning in a bottle. But the glass that formed that bottle is not impervious. And lightning is not the most controlled of shocks. Nevertheless, I'll always look back fondly on this series. Even if there's not a lot of people who will. Here's hoping well for Scott Cawthon, his family, his cast of characters, and everyone he's helped along the way when all is said and done. And with that, I'm Hippie Rat. Thank you so much for watching. And remember, sometimes a story is just a story. But sometimes, to some people, it's just a little more than that. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Bye bye. Take care now. Bye bye. Take care now. Bye bye. 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 Take care now. Bye bye. Bye bye. Take care now. Bye bye.